Well, hi there. I'd like to welcome everyone to Crash Test Test Chess number two. So, still a mouthful to say, um, but this is the second instalment of these quick DVDs, which we're going to have a look at, and uh, hopefully, which are going to help you improve your uh, style of chess and move your ELO, your BCF grade, ECF grade, up to a higher level. Now, in the first of these DVDs, we looked at using the initiative, and hopefully, you got some good ideas from that DVD. Um, basically about when you have an attack, when you have some kind of initiative, how to push that through and not it, let it slip out of your hands. Now in this DVD we're going to have a look at ideas that are really outside of the normal thought process in chess. So we're going to have a look at some amazing moves, some interesting moves, some unusual moves and basically some very funky stuff. So um, the idea of looking at these ideas is to try to get you to think in a similar way to the way the person was thinking and the thought processes that the person used to come up with these ideas. Because if you can use these ideas in your own games, then obviously that will help you think and will enjoy, you'll enjoy chess more because you won't just be looking at it in a black and white way, excuse the pun, you'll be looking at it in a different way and this will hopefully increase your creativity at the chessboard. And I think this is one thing that all chess players want to do, to try to increase their creativity, to think in interesting and unique ways, and basically try to get to the essence of the position. Now, that's really what we're going to do here. We're going to try to get to the essence of each position by using a number of examples straight into different positions, different games, and we're going to have a look at the moves that were played and see why there were such strong ideas. Now, um, I'm going to really try to explain a lot of these ideas verbally because I want you as a viewer to try to absorb as much information as you can in one hour. That's the idea of these quick, cheap DVDs to try to get as much information over to you in a short, kind of like a private lesson you're getting here, a one on one private lesson for five pounds, which can't be a bad deal. And um, this is the kind of thing I might show some pupils which I te teach individually. And um, I'm hoping that in this DVD, really, after watching this, you're going to look at chess in a slightly unusual and different way. When you get to certain positions, you're going to think, oh, I remember that from the DVD, what he was thinking of, and maybe I can use that in my own games in future. So we're going to use, like I said, a number of examples. Um, the first example we're going to have a look at here um, is quite a classic example. I wouldn't be surprised if you've seen it before, but it'll be it's a very good introduction to the DVD. Now, this was a game played between uh, Nimzovich who is obviously a very famous old grandmaster, wrote a, a very good book, one of the most famous chess books called My System, and his opponent was Rubinstein. And um, I believe this was played in Dresden in 1926, uh, a long time ago. Nimzovich had the white pieces, Rubinstein was black, and we reached the position here at the board, uh, which you can hopefully see now on the side of the screen. And um, let's just have a look. First of all, what's going on with this position? Um, because when you're playing chess, obviously chess is not really, you're not going to jump into positions. It's gradual progression. Basically, chess is a battle of plans. Each player has a plan. As well as their own plans, you've got to stop your opponent's plans, which means you've got to think about your own plans. You've got to think about your opponent's plans. You've got to push forward your plans whilst you stop your opponent's plans. So, relatively simple idea here, and when you play in chess, you'll have plans that you try to put into motion, and it'll be a gradual build-up to a critical position. And critical positions, as we're really going to concentrate on in this DVD, is where the game can change to basically a winning position or to a losing position. So critical positions are very, very important. And I believe the position you see here is a pretty critical position. Let's just have a look. This is one thing you should always try to visually do and mentally do when you're playing your own games at all your pieces. What pieces are doing well and what pieces are actually not doing so well. So um, if we have a look at White's pieces here, well, to me it looks like White's strongest piece is his light square bishop. This is a very good piece on c4. 
pointing along the diagonal from A2 to G8. So a lot of pressure along this diagonal. Another very good thing in White's favour is the open E file. Um, rooks on open files, I'm sure you know, is where they should be placed. He has a rook on E2. And at some point, here, a logical move here, like I say, would be rook to e1, just increasing a bit more pressure on the e-file. Now, so it's clear here that the rooks are well-placed, the bishop is well-placed, and something you need to get in the habit of doing in your own games is to look at what pieces you have are not well-positioned. And, um, well, the bishop on d2 is not an incredibly good piece. Does it have potential? Always try to think, well, look at my pieces. Where could I move that piece to? If I could lift that piece up into the air and place it anywhere on the board, where would be a good square for that piece to move to? Now, the bishop on d2, well, if I could place it anywhere on the board, um, it's not entirely clear to me there's a very good square for this piece anyway. I mean, let's have a look. If I put it, let's say, on e5. Well, e5 is a nice outpost, but it's pretty much impossible to get my bishop to e5. So there's not really much I can do with this piece here on d2. On the other hand, let's have a look at the knight on g3. Now, this is an entirely different matter. At the moment, a knight on g3 is often not a very good square for a knight, and here it has, doesn't really have much potential. It can't move to e4. Pawn on f5 is guarding that square. Obviously, you can't move to f5. It doesn't really do much on h5. You just get kicked away by g6. So the knight on g3 strikes me as probably being white's worst piece here. So if I got to this position in a game, I'd probably be thinking, well, my bishop's good. Maybe I'll just play rook e1, increase the pressure. But at the end of the day, I want to get all my pieces to the best squares possible, if I have time to do that. So we've now got to think about black's plans. Is black in any threat to do anything quickly here? Well, no, not really. I mean, black's really not threatening anything here. I mean, he'd love to get rid of my light square bishop, maybe by playing knight a5. But... Knight a5 would be a positional mistake, and I hope you can see why it would be a positional mistake. Knight a5 would allow me to get rid of my bad bishop on d2 for this rather annoying knight. I just play bishop takes a5, ridding myself of my worst piece for a pretty decent black piece. So knight a5 is not really a threat here. Is black going to do anything else here? Well, no, which means we have time to redeploy our pieces to better squares.